Well, hello, everyone. I'm John Ross Perkins. I'm here today to talk a little about the Carbon Language Project, specifically a bit about the syntax and its trade-offs. So I've been at Google since 2006, and I've been working on Carbon for the past couple of years now. Uh, we recently went public, and it's been an interesting time. So I'm excited today to be presenting about it to all of you. Uh, I will make, <laughs> thank you. So I'm going to make sure there's plenty of time for Q&A at the end of this. So if you have any questions, please just note them down and I'll stay around to answer as many as I can. So if you're not familiar with Carbon already, it was announced at CPP North just a couple months ago. Uh, Chandler did a presentation there. Maybe a lot of you have seen that already. And Chandler did the same presentation at the Corsi++ meetup a bit after that. Uh, but I want to give a quick summary for anyone who's unfamiliar. So with Carbon, what we're trying to do is build a successor language to C++. But this whole concept of successor lang language is to us more of a concept than a blueprint. Uh, so let me try to give you a few examples of what it means to us. Uh, so a successor language you're probably familiar with is C++. It's really a successor to C. It takes a superset approach where most C code is valid C++ code. Uh, similarly, you can also see this with JavaScript and TypeScript, where TypeScript adds type annotations to basically what's already valid JavaScript. However, we wanted to take a look at other successor language approaches that maybe change syntax a little more. For example, there's Swift, uh, and with Swift, Apple's trying to make a migration path for Objective-C developers to use a more modern syntax. Uh, there are some interoperability headers, but you can inherit from uh, Objective-C classes in Swift code. And the languages are similar, use a similar memory model. Both are reference counted. So they actually work really well when combined together. Uh, Kotlin goes even a bit further. Uh, similarly, it uses a different syntax from Java. Uh, and uh, using the JVM, it's able to provide really great NROP with uh, Java. Uh, so when you're writing Kotlin code, you don't need a wrapper to call into Java code, and vice versa. It's seamless. And this seamlessness of NROP is where we see uh, carbon headed. Uh, this is our role model, essentially, for what we want a successor to be. That said, the successor for C++ definitely is not clear right now. Uh, there are a lot of options out there. For example, I'll note Rust, which is a really promising language, and it offers great safety options. If you're starting a new, lang or a new project and you're trying to choose a language, Rust is a really good choice. And you can already see it in use in various critical systems. With Carbon, though, we're looking at slightly different use cases. We're looking more at migration from C++ and issues where Rust doesn't uh, serve as well, like when you're dealing with uh, pointers with unclear ownership, uh, it can be hard to translate C++ code into Rust code. That said, Carbon's definitely still under construction. Uh, what it is and what it will be isn't really obvious right now. Uh, it's definitely not ready for use. There's no compiler, for example. Uh, we do definitely want one, and you can try it out sh today with the Explorer. But hopefully it's clear this is an experimental project. We're still trying it out to see how it heads and how it uh, turns out. One thing that probably won't change about Carbon is its goals. And we consider these goals as important to uh, providing a C++ successor. Uh, most important, of course, is performance. But I'm also going to note that interop is obviously essential with C++ code. Uh, these are sort of just table stakes, we think. But to expand and make Carbon more interesting, we think things like understandability, safety, and fast development are really important to support developers. 
We also think, though, that we aren't going to get it right on the first pass. And that's why language evolution is a priority for us. If you look at our project goals, which sort of exist alongside the language goals, these exist to support the evolution of the language. We think the governance and the community around carbon are going to be crucial to it, uh, maintaining it long term. We think, in, most importantly, that community needs to be welcoming. So when we talk about a welcoming community, we think it's important because it, people need to be willing to discuss solutions and do it in a friendly manner. Even when everyone agrees what the trade-offs are, we can disagree about how those trade-offs should be weighed and what the right choice really is. And sometimes it's just necessary to understand you're not going to ever totally agree, but these discussions still need to be handled in a friendly manner, even when they're frustrating. And that's what a welcoming community is for us. It's being able to discuss things in an open manner and being able to just try to find a good solution without worrying about how your opinions are taken. The other project goal is having tools and, it, and an ecosystem. Uh, so this is important to supporting developers. You really can't have developers without tools. If you look at C++, uh, obviously you have a compiler. That's Clang or GCC, maybe MSGC. You know, there are several different compiler options. Uh, if you look at LLVM in particular, they provide several additional tools, like Clang Format for formatting your code, uh, Clang Tidy, which provides various cleanups on your code, and then Clang D, which provides some uh, IDE integrations. A lot of developers really value these tools and their ways to increase productivity. So with Carbon, we want to go even further. Uh, obviously, we still need a compiler. Uh, we think a formatter is really important to, as we talk about evolution, automatic language upgrades become important to us. Uh, IDE is, support is obviously necessary. We want better refactoring support than it, you can really see in C++. And of course, a package manager as well, because again, this is about making developer lives easier. Now obviously, that's a lot of tools. Building these tools requires that the tools actually understand the language. And understanding the language means they ha have to understand the syntax and the context of that language. Uh, just as an example, if you're trying to build tab completion, that tab completion needs to understand which names it may complete to, and that's a bit of context. Uh, if you want to rename a function, then it, you need to find all of the various call sites. Uh, these call sites are an additional form of context. The question, though, is, for me, is how much context does a tool really need? So if you consider in C++, a simple line of code it is pretty easy to read. Uh, this, for example, declares a couple variables, right? You've probably done this plenty of times. Here's a for loop from 0 to n. Uh, this adds a couple of variables and assigns another. This outputs one of the variables. Here's another assignment and another assignment, and then we close the scope. So each individual line had a pretty clear semantic, right? I was able to easily describe that. Uh, but context is sort of the combination of these individual lines. Having seen each line, you might have already figured out what I just showed you, but it can take a moment to figure out, and you know, this is actually a simple Fibonacci implementation. The thing is, C++ isn't always that simple. So consider this line of code. Uh, anyone want to guess what this line does? Sir. So like a function call then. Sure. Uh, any other guesses of what it might do? 
Sorry? Sure, a constructor call. Sure, a three, well, a sort of three-way comparison, but not really. <laughs> and any other guesses? Okay, so you're all right. Uh, the, uh, this certainly can be a function call. If I have int radius as a local variable, then C++ is quite happy to call a function with that. And as you noted, it can also be a constructor call. If I hash define radius, uh, then that's what it turns out to be in C++. But you know, maybe I actually want that hash defined to be a const expert, right? So in that case, what I actually get is a variable declaration. This is a sort of quirk where the lookup on the name radius doesn't find the const expert. So instead it declares a new variable named radius. Uh, and I can show that just by with, you know, calling a function on that object I've just created. And as you noted, yeah, you can also do a comparison with this. You know, all of these are actually valid C++ applications and with the same line of code. So you see, what I'm trying to show you here is when it comes to C++ syntax, context is king. It's hard to understand what a single line of code does without seeing the code around that. And it, as a consequence, a tool needs to understand a lot more about C++ than it may initially seem. Even something simple like syntax highlighting in a case like I just showed you, is going to need a lot of context to know what to do. But should tools really need that much context to work right? So I'll put forward that context matters because it's expensive. It's expensive for both developers and compilers. If you're familiar with C++ style guides, you've probably seen rules like write short functions. And these exist because it, it's important developers be able to see all the context for something very quickly. Similarly, when it comes to something like name lookup in code, uh, that has to go through all that context. This makes for expensive context for compilers. Uh, and in requiring that context, it, everything needs to behave like a compiler in order to actually understand the language. Even the most basic syntax highlighting, it, if it really wants to be correct, needs to be a C++ compiler. So in turn, if we can minimize context, it simplifies uh, things for a lot of the use cases. Uh, it's easier for developers to quickly read behavior. And this is important if you're ever trying to debug code, you probably have a line of code that's the source of your failure. And the quicker you can just jump into that line and figure out what it's doing, the better, right? Similarly, it's faster for compilers to actually parse the code because they don't need to consider all of the possible ways a given line of code could be parsed. Because there are fewer ways it could be parsed, it also means compilers should give, give better errors. Uh, which in turn will it help a developer uh, fix those errors a little faster. It should also you know, be easier for IDEs to parse and highlight. Uh, there's just one significant downside of this. Because C++ code does rely on context so much, it means that any syntax you produce is going to start breaking familiarity with C++. There are other ways we can sort of adjust around that, like trying to maintain an overall structure that's similar to C++, but context is really at the root of why syntax starts to diverge. So there are a few common considerations we go through. Context is just one of them. Uh, I would also note look ahead as another. So look ahead essentially leads to repeat parsing of source code, which can slow down the compilation itself. Uh, similarly, we, we're very concerned with understandability. Like I said, the familiarity for C++ developers is very important to us, so we, 
but there's understandability coming up in other ways too. Uh, this is a very subjective question though of what, what kind of code is understandable. So for inspiration, we'll offer, often look to other languages, uh, not just C++, but also other things like Rust or Python, uh, maybe Ada or Julia. You know, there are a lot of languages out there that have great ideas about what syntax should be. So looping back to some actual carbon syntax, here's sort of what it would look like. And you can see in each of these cases, the, the code written here is, a, is distinct. And maybe even not knowing carbon syntax itself, you can sort of guess, even without my hints, what each of those does. Uh, ideally, this is a little clearer uh, for a newcomer in particular. Let me dive down, though, into the individual changes that are being represented here. Uh, to start with, introducer keywords. These are essential to carbon syntax. You might have noticed var before, but it's not the only introducer keyword. Uh, you might be used to class from C++. We're also adding a template key introducer in a slightly different way. Then there's fn or interface or let. Uh, there will probably be more. This is just a pretty short list of things we're thinking about. What they do is they let the compiler know what you plan to write. Uh, so this does make the declarations a little longer. Like telling the compiler what you're going to do before you do it might be a little unfamiliar with C++. But it does lead to less ambiguity in the syntax. It means the compiler is more likely to understand correctly what you in intended to do. Uh, it also makes it easier to parse code, which, again, makes it more likely that the compiler is going to tell you the right error when you have a small typo. And then there's a matter of consistency in declarations. You might have noticed before that the name always follows the introducer keyword. Uh, this is a deliberate consistency so that you can more easily find identifiers when you're just quickly scanning through code. Another thing you might have noticed is the change to templates. Uh, so template syntax isn't using angle brackets anymore. And in the top example, you can see what a function declaration and call might look like. In the second example, you can sort of see a class declaration and call. And note we're using a dot make instead of a constructor. Uh, this is about trying to make the language just more consistent in its design. So getting back to trade-offs, obviously there is significant familiarity with angle brackets that's being lost. And we know that's something C++ developers will miss. But we think there are, again, benefits to doing that. Uh, for example, it's less ambiguous with comparison operators. This is not going to be confused with a three-way comparison. It also gains consistency with parentheses. So this is getting back to a standard way of uh, passing parameters in C++. Subtly, it also is easy to mix and match with Carbon's gener or typed generics, which I won't talk about too much beyond this. It's just sort of out there and one of the things we consider. And subtly, one thing that making these more function call-like uh, does is it means types are actually expressions in Carbon. And you may not understand you may not quite appreciate how this differs from C++, so I'll try to explain a little further. Uh, in C++, consider this code here. Uh, you declare a function named circle, a struct named circle, and then you do circle paren paren. Uh, who thinks this is invalid code? Nobody. Uh, who thinks that this is calling the function? A couple of people, I think. 
Who thinks that this is constructing an instance of the circle class? A few more people. So it's a little more obvious if you start using, for example, the curly braces to try to use the constructor. Uh, that this resolves to the function no matter what. Uh, so when you do curly braces, it just fails. That's the clear sign it actually called the function. Similarly, you can't even pass this circle thing to a, a template that takes in a type name because it's already going to resolve to the function. But what you can do is put struct before circle. And now C++ knows that it's supposed to use the struct instead of the, uh, instead of the function. Now, I won't give you a Carbon comparison for this because, again, uh, types are expressions in Carbon. This means that probably this example is a name ambiguity problem and would just fail uh, straight up. Uh, next, though, I'd like to talk about operator associativity, get into the last of the uh, possible readings. So for the C++ example, it's actually not great, because if you think about what's happening here, a printer less than circle returns a bool in most cases. And then when you compare a bool with radius, if that radius is probably a numeric value, that's comparing a bool with a numeric value is probably not what you meant. Uh, in Carbon, we uh, solve this by more carefully defining operator associativity. We're going to support less than C++. Uh, what this means is that in the particular case of less than, greater than, they're going to be non-associative. Uh, and as a consequence, you really need one of the two lines of code below to, make, to do whatever you intended with that C++ code. Uh, whether that is throwing an AND in to join the two expressions and get maybe the comparison you actually meant to write, or perhaps writing a ternary expression to turn the uh, printer less than circle into an integer value, which you can then compare to your radius integer, uh, if that's what you intended. Does the C++ line compile? The C++ line compiles. Wow. Yeah. Uh, but the, in Carbon, it wouldn't because the. No, I mean, I mean, oh. Correct. It does not compile because they're less than and greater than are non associative. So you can't have them in the same expression. Uh, without parentheses, at least. So you don't need to read through all of this. I'm just trying to illustrate how C++ and Carbon really differ here. So in C++, you have this ranked precedence ordering, and you have a lot of different operators mixed into associativity groups. Uh, in Carbon, we're taking more of a partial precedence ordering, where we define uh, precedence of operators relative to each other, and then much more restricted uh, associativity groups. What this means, it really, is that expressions will be slightly more verbose. Uh, more parentheses are going to be required to disambiguate certain cases. And that will probably cause some friction for C++ developers who are familiar with C++ precedence rules and love them. Uh, but honestly, we think there are a lot of people who aren't really familiar with C++ precedence rules or just occasionally make accidents. So we think there's an error rate to be reduced here. Uh, finally, I'll talk a little about packages and namespaces, which in C++, names go into a global namespace, right? And you're probably familiar with this. Uh, if you're working on a large code base, you're always told to put names into a namespace, uh, just so that it doesn't conflict with other libraries that you use. Uh, but one of the things we notice about C++ namespaces, though, is frequently you, you end up with this lar large file, maybe thousands of lines, and 
your namespace scope is now thousands of lines. But while you can usually assume that, sometimes it actually splits up in a file, and it's, it can be difficult to notice when you switch from names, one namespace to another. So with Carbon, we're trying out a different approach where namespaces are a bit more declarative, and you end up putting them in each declaration uh, just as a reminder. So this is a little more typing, but it's a constant reminder about which namespace a particular declaration is inside. We think this may be okay, though, because the package is actually also behaving as a namespace here. When I import something like geometry, that is actually pulling in a geometry package, and then within the draw.circle, you can see geometry.circle refers to the same symbol from another package. So this does mean that we won't have more collisions in the global namespace. And if you've ever dealt with ODR issues there, this is lovely. Uh, but the flip side is C++ uses this quite a bit. Uh, and this is obviously going to be sort of a hindrance for really good C++ interop. So it's going to be important to us that we provide some sort of way to map uh, names in a package or other namespace back into the global namespace of C++, uh, or honestly, just whatever namespace is necessary in order to migrate code. Another subtlety here is that packages are currently just a single level of namespaces, and sometimes C++ developers like putting in nested namespaces. Uh, with the namespace as a declaration detail, uh, that can end up being a lot of typing, and deeper namespacing can in turn become really verbose. I think this is just a, something we're going to have to watch and see how well it works out as we try to migrate code and as we get more use cases. Uh, we may just need better solutions here. So, what I'm really hoping you've gotten out of this is that definitely when you're writing tools, they require context. However, if you're designing the language, context doesn't need to be king. Uh, that's a design choice. And we're heading in a different direction with Carbon. This does, again, mean that syntax of Carbon is going to drift, but it does mean we get, hopefully, better tools and simpler tools, and probably more tools because they'll be easier to write. That said, uh, there are obviously trade-offs here. Not everybody's going to agree with the trade-offs being made. Uh, building a language that, where context isn't king does mean that there's less consistency, and people will miss that. Sometimes code will end up being more verbose. Sometimes it'll feel a little unfamiliar to C++ developers. And this is just, for us, a trade-off that we can disagree on how we weight these, but as long as we can discuss this in a reasonable manner and be friendly with each other as we discuss it, maybe we can come to a better solution. Maybe there are better ways to do what we're trying to do. And I can actually say that for all the language. Like, a lot of what we're doing is just experimental right now. Things aren't really settled. And that's why we made Carbon public when we did. Uh, there are use cases and, and good arguments that we're just not going to come up with on our own. And we're really looking for the C++ community to help us out in, in our evolution there. We've already changed parts of our design in response to feedback. Uh, we made some poor decisions that we, just the small group of us didn't notice. So if helping us correct and improve is interesting to you, and you're interested in trying to contribute to Carbon, uh, you know, we're open to that. And uh, we're hoping that you appreciate the thought we put into the design and uh, give your own thoughts as well. Uh, if you are interested, I've included a couple links up at the, on the right side. Uh, that's Compiler Explorer and the GitHub page. Uh, 
So I hope you've all found this to be pretty interesting. Like I said, I've tried to leave a fair amount of time for questions. So would anyone like to start? Yes. So the question was, what's the original motivation to try to make a successor? For us, it's that we really like C++. Like, I've worked in C++ for maybe 25 years now. Uh, Chandler used to be on the C++ board. But where we see issues with C++, we'd like to see it evolve faster. We think there are maybe places where performance could improve. Uh, and it, we think there are ways to help syn the syntax, as I showed, uh, and tr improve lives for developers so that, uh, in particular, new people entering the industry can learn it to write a performance-critical language or use a performance-critical language more easily. So it's sort of that amalgam of concerns that led us to w decide a successor language might be a good choice. Uh, if it's okay, I'll. Or... Uh, okay, uh, you keep talking about evolution. Uh, I, I don't really understand what you're referring to the evolution of the language itself and the specification in terms of the fact that C++ has like a three year cycle, both in our uh, changes. What we're talking about is the community of developers and the tools that they use. So, the question is, what do I mean by evolution? Is it the specification rate of change where C++ changes every three years? Or is it the community of developers? And here I'd say it's actually more about the uh, specification. So you say C++ changes in every three years, but I'll actually point a little to the ABI. So if I recall correctly, it's been over a decade since the ABI of C++ has changed. And that's not for the lack of people asking to change the ABI. It's just people don't want to. Uh, or at least there's not a consensus on the committee to. So when we talk about evolution, it's about the ability of carbon to move it forward faster. There are also other parts that even if C++ were changing faster, probably wouldn't change though. Like that printer circle radius example I gave would be really hard to evolve C++ away from. So radical change like that would just be hard to do with C++. Um, sorry, if I may. Uh, so the question was, when I showed the templates example, the template keyword was obviously ta able to take in types and values, but can it take in things like identifiers and other things for metaprogramming, uh, correct? So we're definitely thinking about metaprogramming. I think it's going to take a slightly different form. Uh, if you're familiar with Circle, we think that's a really interesting project. Uh, in addition, Rust's uh, metaprogramming approach where it starts to operate on the AST is interesting as well. I think we're going to end up with something slightly in that direction, uh, but it's a little early to tell, like we haven't really discussed it through too much. It's something that in our heads is something we definitely need because it's all clearly important within C++ and mainly it's a question of how we achieve it uh, because we don't want to do you know, C++ is pound defined preprocessor macros. Yep. Um. Reference in for, for the so what are your, your for 
So the question is, when people talk about C++, they include things like the standard library or boost, and what's our plan for Carbon, right? Um, so with Carbon, we do want to provide a core library as part of the language. Uh, the exact shape that takes is going to take time to figure out, and I'm sure, as with C++, it's going to expand over time. Uh, we will have sort of a leg up in that with interop we'll be able to, re well, we should be able to reuse large parts of the standard template library and boost. Uh, not, not as like intuitive carbon things, but as things that if you really need a C++ API, it's accessible to you. Uh, but eventually we hope to have a full-fledged uh, standard library equivalent to these. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the question is, where do we draw the line for interoperability? Uh, C++ makes a lot of choices. Uh, I'll actually give a couple examples like CTAD or Svine that maybe we don't want to copy into Carbon. And I think the answer is sort of where it starts feeling weird to us. Like, this is a subjective answer. Uh, I would actually say even including templates is kind of a concession here. Uh, so we would say the checked generics are clearly superior to templates, but you definitely need templates uh, for compatibility and for migration. But there are certain aspects about things like ADL where we're hoping not to have to implement them, uh, at least not full, fundamentally to the language that we can limit it to the interop layer. And I think that'll be part of the trick really is trying to contain uh, some of these things so that you can interop with them, but they aren't necessarily part of Carbon's uh, grammar itself. So. A loose answer, it's like, thank you. <laughs> um, yes? So uh, the question is, how will the uh, C++ interop with work with Carbon? Um, and I'll say right now, it's not implemented. It's part of the tool chain. Uh, it would actually be hard to implement without of the tool chain because of how we plan to do it. Uh, but to just sort of summarize, we're building on top of LLVM specifically because we want to call straight into Clang's libraries. Uh, to sort of sketch out this plan, we'll parse C++ files using the Clang AST do a walk over the AST to figure out which identifiers we actually need to collect and put them into a CPP like pseudo package kind of thing. Uh, and through that, that would be how carbon code calls into C++. Uh, going in the other direction, I think there are sort of two different approaches in play. One is that sort of speaking to the advantage of the C++ ABI uh, being fairly stable. We will probably generate essentially pseudo, like generate headers, C++ headers, uh, and ABI compatible endpoints behind them. And that in particular is a little important if you're dealing with cross compiler uh, use cases, like if you want to take C++ code built by MSVC and mix it with uh, Carbon code. But we may also try to support a better integration if you have just Clang and LLVM, such that it wouldn't actually generate files, it would just sort of hook into the AST more directly. 
Uh, yes. So the question was, we keep saying, use another language uh, if you're starting a new project. Uh, but Carbon's really there if you have a large existing C++ code base. But really, how many companies have large existing C++ code bases? Um, I think that's an interesting question. It's part of what we're really trying to explore. Uh, I do suspect it's more than just us. I think there are others interested here, like uh, David's nodding. He represents Adobe, and he's been pretty interested. Uh, but you know, the, there are other use cases, too. I think this morning, Walter was talking about HEP and its uses of uh, C++. I think the National Science Lab Laboratories are also heavily C++. Uh, if you look at other companies like Microsoft or Amazon, I'm sure they have C++ code bases as well. Uh, like, the industry is rife with these cases. It's also existing in academia and government use cases. So I, I think it's not a question of whether these are out there. Uh, and I should actually add even open source projects like uh, I want to say Qt is heavily C++, if I recall correctly, and it's another big code base. So I think they're out there if people... I don't know. Yeah. I think, though, that people won't really, like, if people aren't ready to do the investment to move off their C++ code base to another language now, I think it's hard to see people wanting to move off of C++ to another language or Carbon to another language in the future. Where we see Carbon able to offer a proposition here is if we can make the migration really cheap. And that's really the question, is how cheap can we make a migration uh, such that if developers are actually happy to pay that cost and switch languages, rather than it being something that, like, you'd have to stop development for a year in order to switch. Uh, that, so, we say don't use Carbon today, uh, and that it's not really targeting these use cases, but, you know, there are these large code bases, and they're not ever really going to disappear. Uh, yes? So if I might put this, if I can try to summarize, uh, if you try to use Carbon, you also have to know all of the various versions of C++. So why learn both? Um, so is that true? I would say there's probably going to be a transitional phase where it's true, uh, for better or worse. Because in order to migrate away from C++, it does mean you have to learn Carbon, and it probably means you have to know the C++ code too. Um, so there are a couple things we're trying to do to make this easier. Uh, 
we're trying to maintain similar semantics uh, so that it doesn't feel like you're learning a completely new language. Uh, but long term, we also hope that more code, like if you have a large project that you are able to actually migrate most of the code to Carbon. So long term, uh, after you've done a migration, you probably still have C++ libraries you use because like uh, Readline, for example, is a great library that I, you know, maybe they would switch to Carbon, maybe they wouldn't. But if not Readline, then something else won't switch, but will still be really useful. Uh, so some level of understanding is probably going to remain important, but you might not need a full fluid understanding to understand all of what that library does. Um, I might make a comparison to how I frequently use Python as well, and I'm a reasonable Python developer at this point. Uh, I've also used Java, but I hardly know Java, but I use Java tools plenty. Uh, so I can use the language without really understanding it. Uh, in back. So the question is, what about a migration path where you don't really need to know uh, uh, Carbon at all? Or sorry, don't need to know C++ at all. And instead, it's just hidden away. Uh, I mean, I think this really depends on where you run into bugs in the libraries you use. If, you don't, if you're using C++ libraries that don't have bugs, you'll never have to look at the code, right? Uh, you don't really have to understand how going back to the readline example, how readline works. You just call into it and it works. Uh, so it, that is where I think you may be able to really step away from C++ code in a transition. Uh, yes? Yeah, so the question is, whereas functions and like basic structs offer convenient uh, endpoints for transition, something like a template that actually involves instantiation is a lot more complex to deal with. Uh, particularly when you start dealing with things like name lookup and the, the way C++ delays name lookup during type, or in type checking and so, so on. Uh, and the answer I can give to that is, that's why templates are in Carbon. Uh, the particular behaviors around instantiation in C++ are why we're copying the whole template setup into Carbon, pretty much. Or I shouldn't say copying, but trying to provide something semantically equivalent. When you talk about something like std vector in particular, though, we're not actually translating std vector into carbon code. Uh, you can make your own std vector equivalent, but it wouldn't be std vector as that specific ABI. Instead, when we deal with something like AB, with interop, uh, we would be, as I mentioned before, using clang to parse the std vector header, and essentially directly, like if you did, if you tried instantiating a std vector on a carbon class, it would actually be using the C++ uh, Clang AST version of that template and instantiating it on a C++ API uh, version of the Carbon class. Like, 
sort of all hidden sort of behind the layers within a wrap, ideally. And it may feel like when you actually write the code, it may look carbony in general, but actually a lot of stuff going on in the background. And this is part of why carbon won't be ready for quite a bit yet. Yes? Yeah, so the question is, have we considered sort of optimizing for different domains? Uh, yeah, and with embedded as an example. Um, I think yes and no. Like maybe Chandler has thought about this more than I have. Uh, but we have thought about it at least in security contexts where, uh, for example, one way of hardening code is to, uh, whenever you allocate a pointer, just zero out the data, or on destruction, zero out the data. Uh, but that comes out a smidgen of overhead. Uh, or as another, another example, uh, are people here familiar with things like address sanitizer, ASAN? Um, so the, uh, if you're familiar, you know it's kind of expensive to run. Um, but maybe it would be great to run a draft sanitizer in an otherwise optimized build. Um, so we'll, we think for security in particular, there may be a couple standard build modes like performance, of course, but then also maybe a hardened build mode, and then maybe some knobs to go back and forth between them. I can imagine, though, with uh, with something like embedded that you may want a different set of knobs. Uh, I haven't thought about that too much. I don't know if there's too much discussion about it right now. Uh, but at the very least, when it comes to something like changing the std, well, a std vector equivalent implementation, we, aren't, we definitely are committing to having no ABI durability. So that should actually offer some ability to uh, switch out implementations of, of what might otherwise be considered core library pieces based on your actual target. That's what I'm asking because it's like an opportunity to do Yeah. I mean, hopefully, hopefully it works is, I think, what I mean. Um, other questions? Yes? So the question was, is Carbon a side project or a main project for, for us? Uh, it's our main project, mostly. Uh, for me, it's my main project. Chandler has other things he gets busy with at times, uh, as does Richard. But there are a few, like, they're trying to make as much time for it as they can. Uh, it is a project for us. Uh, any other, yes?
Yeah, so are we going to tackle changing defaults like default const? Um, I'll say subtly one of the things about dot make is, as a constructor is we're sort of changing away from implicit constructors to instead make them a little more explicit by default. You might have also noticed how when I was doing the uh, Boolean example, I had a ternary converting my Boolean to, or my integer, or sorry, I'm saying that wrong. A ternary to convert the Boolean result of a comparison to an integer in order to compare it with another integer. Uh, that's because another default changing is that there won't be uh, implicit bool integer comparisons. Uh, so yeah, we're to, trying to mix in a number of these into the language. Um, sorry, do you have a question? Uh, so the question is, are there others in the community outside of Google? So I'll point to David again, who I like pointing at, um, who is not a Googler, he's at Adobe. The, so for a long time, we've also been working with Jeremy Seek and a couple of, of his students at Indiana University. Um, there are also a number of people watching Carbon, uh, Bryce included, who you know, have interest but aren't as heavily involved. Um, and then since going public, we've gained a few people uh, who are significant contributors. Uh, so I might note James J and uh, PMQTT as a couple, that's just off the top of my head. Yeah. So, sorry, Daisy is pointing out to me, hint, hint, <laughs> that she had actually been involved in Carbon before she joined Google. Uh, yes? Uh, so with less, uh, with less syntactic ambiguity, will it be possible to write a declarative uh, parser for the language? So currently we're using Bison to write a basic parser, if that helps you get an idea of how complex it is. So essentially not very. We, uh, Compiler Explorer is using regular expressions pretty much for its highlighting, and that seems to work really well. Uh, so hopefully we keep down this path that it's actually really easy to parse. Uh, any other questions? Looks like we may be out of questions. So thank you for your time, everyone.